<laughs> Am I still on here? You're good. I'm good? All right. Yes, sir. This podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners and viewers like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And to stay updated with video releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening, and thanks for watching. I'm Rani Shatar, and this is The Beirut Banyan. I can't think of a bigger privilege than showing up in this wonderful home hours before you're flying away after less than 24 hours of meeting you in person in a cafe. Uh, First time I go to that cafe (laughs) and a friend of mine casually suggests that I speak to you. Why would I talk to a complete stranger? And she says, no, no, you know him. Hisham Bu Nasif. I'm like, of course I know Hisham, but I don't want to interrupt her. So she picks me up and takes me towards you. And I think it's the best decision I made because what better way to reflect on the current state of affairs mm. with someone that is so invested in this country mm. and like many of us, temporarily leaving, finding a way to sort of bridge two lives at once mm. maybe but never letting go permanently, which is important. Mm. And this resonates with me completely. Mm. Mm. So that's my way of saying thank you. It's my pleasure. And uh, I want your bookshelf so I can use this for my podcast. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely bookshelf. <laughs> Hisham, let me start by asking you sure. something very easy, Please. straightforward, before we get into the subject of federalism. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's something that I... I sort of said in passing yesterday, um, I think there's preconditions necessary before we can even get to the agreements or disagreements Mm. surrounding federalism. Mm. And I think there's two words that matter, and I Mm. think they're paramount. One is sovereignty, Mm. and one is neutrality. Mm. Do you consider these two fundamentals Mm. as a precondition? Mm. And if you don't, uh, do you think it's okay to talk about federalism while ignoring the other two? Mm. And I'm sorry to start with a very big question, no, but I like to keep it simple in the sense that I can't imagine the conclusion happening without the first issues being addressed. And those are the issues that I think have been largely ignored mm. and could be going back now 50 some years. Mm. So let's start with the heavy, simple yeah, yeah. question. I think. Um Federalism would be morally abhorrent, Mm. absent uh, first sovereignty. Um, And then, uh, well, it would be mainly morally abhorrent, absent sovereignty, period. Mm. What do we mean by sovereignty? You basically mean, and let us say it as it is, sovereignty basically means that Hezbollah is disarmed. Okay? This is what I mean by sovereignty. That's a condition for sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So essentially, if you're saying federalism without sovereignty... What would that imply? Right. It's implying basically that you are ready to cut a deal mm. with Hezbollah, allowing Hezbollah to control its part of the country mm-hmm. and then hoping that Hezbollah would allow you to control your part of the country. First yeah. of all, why I'm telling you it's morally abhorrent, basically it would mean that everything that Hezbollah has done to this country all the crimes uh, that this organization perpetrated are going to go away just like that. And even if you say, well, that's politics, right? It's not even smart because Hezbollah does not want to control just the South and the Beka and then would let you control whatever, Kisarwin. Hmm. Hezbollah wants what basically the logic of Hezbollah is. What is mine is mine and what is yours is mine as well. So not only it's a morally abhorrent way of thinking. It's not a terribly smart way of thinking. It's basically a deep misunderstanding 
of what Hezbollah is and what Hezbollah wants from this country. And also, lest we forget, Hezbollah is not just a Lebanese player. Mm -hmm. There's the yeah. Iranian dimension in this. And Iran did not invest so much in this country just so they can control, I don't know, tier. Iran right. basically is a hegemonic regional power aiming to control Iraq, aiming to control Syria, and aiming to control Lebanon. By that I mean not just a part of Syria, or not just a part of Iraq, or not just a part of Lebanon, but the whole Levant, including Lebanon. So essentially, to sum up, federalism under the weapons of Hezbollah, it's basically, we're back to the logic of alliance des minorités, the alliance between minorities, which I find repelling. And, and by the way, if we think a, a bit about history, uh, the biggest clashes in the last 200 years happened between you know, minorities, not between minorities per se, but mm. between you know, players who belong to minorities. For instance, the 1860 massacres right. in, in Lebanon. That's, you know, Maronites and Jews, right? Yes. 1845, 1840. So basically the uh, tragedies of Lebanon in the 19th century, it was minority versus uh, minority. The death of Kamal Jumblat, right. okay, the supreme leader, the historical leader of the Druze community in, in Lebanon. He wasn't killed, Kamal Jumblat was not killed by a regime that is Sunni dominated. Kamal Jumblat was killed by a regime that is Alawi. Dominated, So that's minority versus minority. So this idea of alliance de minorité, the alliance between minorities, which also I find morally repellent, but also uh, uh, not terribly smart, because historically, the hi history does not suggest that there is some kind of natural interest uh, pushing minorities to ally with other minorities. So the whole thing, truly, for various reasons, uh, moral and otherwise, is, is deeply unappealing to me. I'm a Lebanese. I think as a Lebanese, what I want for this country is to be sovereign. I want just the Lebanese army. I mean, I don't think it's too much to ask, right? I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm not, a, it's not, I don't know, it's a, an ultra right wing thinking or whatever to say, you know, in Lebanon, okay, I accept people to be on the right or on the left. Some are rightist, some are leftist. Some of us are conservatives, others are liberal. Fine, you know, we can, you know, uh, uh, we can have our opinions, yep. but we cannot have, you know, multiple uh, security structures. We should have just one security structure and one army, which is the, you know, the Lebanese army. That's not exactly an extreme way of thinking politics. So as a Lebanese, I begin with sovereignty, and neutrality and federalism would come later. That was a long answer. We can that talk is, more about That is yeah. exactly why I want to talk to you, because yeah. you're the perfect person to ask these questions, and you, you're showing exactly why there's nuance to this debate mm. and why people should not be so afraid of what is too often, I think, considered to be, at, at least not that long ago, mm. on the fringe, on the margin. Yeah. And if it was being discussed, it was not necessarily understood beyond... These are right-wing discussions. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think, I think it's time to actually flush out what yeah. this topic is. Yeah, yeah. And the reason, I know sovereignty and neutrality are episodes on their own. Yeah. Uh, but if I can maybe allow it to be a somewhat shallow analysis just to get to federalism. You cannot be shallow if you want to, Ronnie. <laughs> I, 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 I know you enough. Not on person, but, you know, I follow your program. Anyway, go ahead, please. I'm glad you gave me five hours to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you have to travel. <laughs> I could stay here forever. <laughs> so I understand what you're describing, yeah. and I think it's a shared sentiment, that sovereignty is what the country struggled with mm prior to the Civil War, yeah. and maybe even going into the late 1960s, was the last time uh, that word could be applied, a difficult mm. uh, a struggle mm. with sovereignty. Um, and maybe we can pick out exactly what that means in the Lebanese context. Mm. Beyond just that the Lebanese army is the sole armed authority, yeah. which is a central pillar to this, yeah. and beyond that there's one government governing Lebanon, yeah. And beyond that, state institutions belong to the Lebanese and they're not able to be hijacked or subverted mm. or occupied. Mm. Uh, if you could just spell out in simple language, uh, what, exactly, what exactly did Lebanon lose 
in the late 1960s that, that makes this word so difficult to reclaim. Mm. And I'm asking it in a way because for me it's 1969 Cairo Agreement, mm. but I don't know if that is really the death knell to sovereignty in Lebanon. That it could be things that are not necessarily discussed maybe in a, in a, in a meaningful way. So for example, uh, we take it for granted that Lebanon does not, did not have an ambassador to Syria, mm. for example. Mm. The Syrians did not have representation mm. here. They had their army yeah. here. Um, Hezbollah is Iran's ambassador mm. to Lebanon and Lebanon's ambassador mm. to Iran. It's not mm. diplomatic. But again, that's maybe keeping it too shallow. Mm. Let me, I think I know where you're heading. Yeah, well, I mean, if you could flush it out in a yeah, way that... Let, let me tell you, uh, essentially, uh, what, what's the opposite of sovereignty? <laughs> and this is how I can you yeah. know, move back to explain. It's 2021, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, absolutely. That's on a practical level. Right. So on a theoretical level, what, mm. what does that mean? Uh, when you, you as a country, you have a, a regional function, and that regional function essentially is being the place where proxy wars can be waged. And... Uh, uh, struggle for regional hegemony by proxy. Uh, when this is your function, you're like this space where all the hegemons or would-be hegemons agree. Look, I'm not going to attack you directly, or most of the time, I'm not going to attack you directly, mm, yeah. and you're not going to attack me directly either. Right. What we're going to do, we're going to fight it out in a safe space, <laughs> safe space for everyone except for the people living in that safe space, of course, and that safe space is Lebanon. This is when so you have that. battlefield almost. Yeah, battlefield end. Lebanon. Yeah. So the opposite of sovereignty mm. is when you are battlefield Lebanon. And in that battlefield Lebanon, all uh, the struggles for power, the competition for who's going to be the top dog in this region, etc., etc., right. can be waged safely because people accept that that's the rule of the game. Now, we're not the only country uh, who's been like that. I mean, if you know the history of Europe, you know that right. what later became Germany mm-hmm. um, was basically this is where people fight it out, right? Or Switzerland, in fact. What later became Switzerland, basically right. this is where, you know, the big players in the game, you know, the Russians or the French or the, you know, or, or you know, Austria-Hungary or what have you. This mm-hmm. is where, okay. Now, that's our function and and that's our role. And as long as we keep being used to play that role, we're not going to be a sovereign country. A sovereign country, by definition, is, is a country. It's not um, a place, uh, uh, a battlefield, essentially. So when we say cl- reclaiming our sovereignty is basically shedding our function above anything else. It means shedding our function as battlefield Lebanon. We're tired of this. We've served as a battlefield for like at least 50 years. Sick right. and tired of this. So when I say I want my country to be sovereign, it basically means, look, Iran, or look, Turkey, or look, whatever, you have ambitions for regional hegemony, excellent, good for you. Go take these ambitions and spread them or, or project power somewhere else. Not, not in my country, because we're sick and tired of being that place where anybody, if your name is Abdel Nasser, or if your name is Khamenei, <laughs> or if your name is Yasser Arafat, or if your name is Benjamin Netanyahu, or whatever your name is, you know, this is where you basically project power. Go project... We are all very powerful players, good for you. Okay, go project your power somewhere else. In that sense, and this, mm. in a way, it's a natural segue to mm. neutrality, but before mm. we go in that direction, yeah. it, it's clear at this point that the state is not sovereign, mm. and it hasn't been. Even yeah. in the post-war <clears throat> years, that Lebanon experienced indirect, yeah. turn direct occupation. Yeah. Um, let alone that the Israelis were still in the south until yeah. 2000. Yeah, true. And the Syrians st- extended their welcoming far beyond Ta'if's agreement, of course. which was signed primarily with their blessing that they went from two to three years to 15. Yeah. And that even post-2005, and you, you mentioned it uh, uh, in a way that I think it, it, there's, no, there's no disagreement, there's no even debate, Hezbollah is not a Lebanese militia. Mm. And it is, in many ways, serving an Iranian security apparatus in Lebanon. So it in itself prevents a sovereign state from, uh, from coming into fruition. But this is 51 years since Lebanon was last, what we would maybe describe as sovereign. Mm. Could you 
point at the direct reasons why this has become such a difficult challenge for Lebanese. Not the regional reasons for the Cairo Agreement, mm -hmm. not even the regional considerations in the 1980s, or let alone why the Syrian state so long and why Iran is invested today. Not mm -hmm. that, more the inward, the local, uh, the local drive to reclaim that. It doesn't seem to take hold. And I'm going to exclude those that tried to do that but were killed. Because there are examples of some Lebanese that went that road mm. and they were killed. But if we can shelve that in a way that's, that's, uh, uh, in a way that's sort of not uh, discrediting what they tried yeah. to do, I don't sense that this is talked about fluently, thoroughly, and that the question remains elusive rather than front and center. Mm. And I don't know if you see it this way as well, or if you see it maybe as these challenges are too big for Lebanese, and therefore they do not address them head on. Okay, so let me, understand, let me see if I understood the question. It sounds like there are two questions here. Why it's very difficult once we lose our sovereignty, which happens all the time, to claim mm -hmm. it back, that's one question. Yes. And why people or activists are not talking enough about the sovereignty issue and talking about other things, is that, is that essentially what you're... Yes, and also that it's, I mean, it's 51 years. So it's not something yeah. that you can go back in time. You cannot reverse the trend that mm. easily. But I don't, it is those two questions in a way that it doesn't seem to be the driving force of the recent protests or the opposition. Mm. It's in the background mm. rather than the foreground. Mm. And most Lebanese politicians that emerged in the last mm. three decades at least mm. did not really put this at the forefront. Why should they? They're puppets of foreign powers. Of course they're not going. That's like expecting Marshal Pétain to, you know, protest against the heavy-handedness of the Gestapo in Paris. Right. Marshal Pétain is the leader or president of the country because of the Gestapo. Mm -hmm. So you cannot expect uh, collaborators. Could I say, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, sorry, I'm yeah. uh, taking, I will, yeah. I will interrupt carefully here. Yeah. I should have mentioned I'm including academics, experts, and Yeah, okay, so I, I see, listen, I see where you're heading. Listen, there are multiple points for mm. this. First of all, there is fear. Okay, you of all people should know, you know, when you are a courageous pat patriot, what could happen to you. Okay? Um, so the fear factor is big. Okay, we're not dealing here with... I don't know, uh, Jeffersonian liberals <laughs> who, would, <laughs> who would accept or take, you know, a critique lightly. Mm. Um, and then that's, that's a factor that I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have more courage than others, uh, are ready to take more risks than others, and others don't want that. And that's something I understand. But, you know, that's one big, big factor yeah. explaining you know, why people are not talking about this issue as much as they should. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the other reason, of course, is basically ambition. Um, the fact that you are in the, not you, the fact that someone is in the opposition does not automatically mean he's someone morally good or driven by um, patriotism. Mm. You could be in the opposition simply put because you found no place for you in, in the big parties for various reasons, okay? So you go to the opposition. But you know very well that you are basically jockeying for power in a system controlled by Hezbollah and controlled by uh, the allies of Hezbollah. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're basically you're waiting for an opening to jump from the opposition to uh, the Lebanese regime. So if this is what drives you, personal ambition, you're not going to piss off uh, the master of the game. And you could still so, claim to be opposition, yeah, but, but it's yeah, an opposition to... Yeah, soft opposition. It's an opposition <laughs> to, the, to the tentacles of the regime, yeah, not, but not, not the, the hardcore right, of the yeah. regime. Because the hardcore of the, of the regime, you can say uh, whatever you want about it, but it's not a stupid hardcore. Anyway, had they been a stupid actor, they wouldn't have become the hardcore in the first place. Right. Mm. So basically, and so basically, they would allow a critique of I don't know Nabi Burre or a critique of Jibran Basil or whatever. That's mm. fine. Mm. Mm. Uh, um, these are you know the outside layers of the regime. So basically, this is how you do it. If you are someone in the opposition, you basically are just bidding your time, waiting to become part of the elite. 
and and you don't want to piss off the the master of the game mm. um so you you don't I sense and, the yeah. same thing among opposition yeah. parties yeah, yeah. but then I do <coughs> see that there's a healthy rift and that it's not the the hmm, the regime enablers within mm. the opposition mm. I think their names are well known yeah. uh the opposition activists that want to throw out the status quo yeah they seem to not want to go down that road anyway yeah. even if they're nominally opposed mm. to Hezbollah as it currently exists mm. but they still are not able to address sovereignty as the core or one of the core issues that it's almost a back burner yeah even among the noble the more noble yeah. opposition figures yeah listen then you have yet another problem lack of organization mm. um to basically to be effectively in politics you need organization mm. okay that means you need money among other things right you need people who do that full time right you need access to the media you need a lot of things that you do not have actually. right right so you end up with talking about the noble part of the opposition yes they are i mean they're there they're patriotic but they are at this point sadly disorganized um and sadly lacking in funding and sadly lacking in so many other things that they need to basically transform themselves into an effective uh, political party or an effective political movement at least that right. being said Ronnie, i was uh on the streets uh on august 4 a few a few weeks ago yes that was make no mistake that was an anti hezbollah opposition that was a pro sovereignty movement in the streets of beirut i was there i was listening to what the people were saying what the people were chanting from a to z it was about sovereignty from a to z it was about you know beirut hurra hurra iran barra barra or some something like that from a to z i mean it, it just did not stop these people on the streets that day were sovereignists who are opposed to Iranian hegemony over the country and were opposed also to the illegal arms of of Hezbollah uh, it's there the dynamic is there yeah the noble opposition as you call it is there at this point it's sadly weak and disorganized but my hunch is it's not going to remain as weak and as disorganized forever you know i i'm glad you're I'm glad you're able to offer that uh you're portraying I was there and I did see the Iran out yeah, sort of, of manners course. uh some even maybe what I I think is too often misunderstood altogether 1559 Yeah 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 of course and it's almost um it's treated as if it's a concocted conspiracy yeah. although it's a UN Security yeah. Council resolution and I did see those activists and they reminded me of the same sort of um that's the consistency mm. since 2005 and it still exists but i i don't know if i saw that overwhelmingly anti status quo in the iranian context mm. or even in the sovereignty i saw accountability corruption transparency uh justice even some funnier sort of photos of Tariq Bitar almost like he's a our national hero right right yeah and i don't know if i saw it that way as a deliberately uh pro sovereignty um anti hasbullah if you will mm. anniversary mm. i saw that side of the equation a little a little too quiet mm. But maybe I was just in the wrong stretch of the no, protest. I don't know. I was in Badaru, and then oh. I, I, we moved. We <laughs> That's moved. right. That's funny. <laughs> oh, <I wasn't. laughs> so we were walking from Badaru all yes. the way to the port. Right? Okay, so we're the same, just, same path. Yeah, yeah, I just I was you know hearing this all the time from the mm. beginning till now. Of course, people want sovereignty plus they want something else. Clearly, they were also clamoring against corruption. or clamoring against you know in favor of social justice and and what have you and that's good yes. but that doesn't mean i mean if you want sovereignty plus it doesn't mean that you don't want sovereignty right. no no i think the dynamic is there and growing by the mm. way mm. um uh the problem is well in fr- i go back to my to my french it's in uh, l'état latent which basically it's latent it's out there yes but i keep saying in french état latent plus catalyseur égale état actif basically latent state plus catalyzer becomes an active state right what, i see what 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 we don't have is the catalyzer yes now 
who can be the catalyzer? Um, middle class activists, uh, patriots. The problem is, Ronnie, is, you know... Did you say patriarch? Patriots. Patriots. Oh, patriots, patriots okay, yes, patriots, yes. Patriots, The problem is these people, to be able to sustain their way of living, they have to leave. Or they have to be, you know, leave yeah. part-time, as I do, you know, spend part of your time abroad, work, yeah. you know, support your family, get, come back, etc. Yeah. I mean, that's good, but that's not how you create, you know, a radical movement for change. Radical movement for change needs people um, who are full-time activists in their own country, you know. And this is something because of the structural pressure of the economy, basically, that we are struggling to, to find. So we're trying, for instance, to create a political movement. Good people are not lacking, mm. but you know, some of them are in Dubai, some of them are uh, in the States, some of them are in France, some of them are, are in Beirut, um, some of them are in Beirut and leaving now, etc. So, I mean, it's, um, it's not impossible to find smart, dedicated, capable Lebanese. But they are under a lot of strain because of the economic situation. So right. they are either, either leaving or leaving part-time or what have you. Yeah. So can you, in these conditions, uh, create you know, a radical, and I mean radical, movement for, for change? Yes, yes. Even in these impossible situations, you can still create that movement, but it's going to take some time. And this is, I think this is where we are. Uh, there's enough people who are convinced that we need to move on in a serious way, that time for BS is over, and time for confrontation uh, has come. And confrontation does not mean you go on TV and you say some, you know, fancy stuff, and then you go back. <laughs> that's not, you, you, that's not, uh, that's not how, no, no, I mean organization. You know, I mean, you know, yeah, I like putting the, in the yes. hours. Right. Right. Putting in the hours, organizing people on Akkar. And by the way, Lebanon is not just Beirut, right? You, but when I say a radical organization, it will have to be present in Akkar, in Tripoli, in Balbek al-Hirmil, in the south, and of course in Mount Lebanon, etc. This will take time. This is where I believe efforts should go. Um, but it's not an impossible mission. It's a difficult mission, but it's a necessary mission, and we're tackling it. I think it's the same goals that were never that were left unfulfilled, going back 16 yeah. years now, and that's it. We're left <clears throat> with the remnants of the Syrian system yeah. that Lebanese are still struggling against in different ways. Yeah. And before we jump into neutrality, just yeah. the last question: uh, I hear it too often, mm. where these are sometimes opposition members talking about other opposition <laughs> members, <laughs> or they claim all to be opposition. <laughs> I don't know if any of them are opposition. Um, What's the criteria, anyway? I think yeah. there, is, there is one criteria. Mm. If you're not a sovereignist, you're not in the opposition. If, if the Hezbollah issue is not your number one item, I'm not saying the only item, mm. but if it's not your own number one item, uh, you're not in the opposition. At least that's my criteria. So it's just you and me, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Welcome to the opposition. <laughs> no it's going to be very lonely, it's, right? It's just this room. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> Organization. Here it is. I, I hear something that it doesn't resonate with me. Yeah. That um, Lebanon has many militia. Lebanon has... Every political party is a militia, either that either that once existed or is a militia in waiting. Um, that Hezbollah's uh, position mm. is diminished mm. when trying to balance out mm. an equation. Mm. That the Lebanese forces is now a militia, mm. or that any group that is uh, armed mm. or has weapons and is using them mm. uh, is either an X turning into a real mm. one or already is one. Mm. And that Hezbollah's rule is almost softened. Mm. That does not resonate with me one bit. I and think it's utter BS. It's okay. So, let me ask you then. Yeah. Why is this common in discourse? Yeah. Well, I think. And I, it's not just pro. It's not just uh, uh, what you described earlier. Mm. I don't know if I want to use his name in particular, but whatever. Mm. Not the Sharb al Nahas approach to Hezbollah. Mm. That's very cautious. Mm. But it's really among even the more radically charged opposition mm. activists mm. that will deliberately say the Lebanese forces are full of militia men. Mm. And I see that they are the future of yeah. this country, yeah. but they don't they just don't get that point right. But they misunderstand yeah. it. Yeah, I think there's a lot of um 
hidden sectarianism. I mean, when I was talking about uh, the factors uh, explaining why the sovereignty thing or the Hezbollah thing is not as big out there mm. as it should be. So if you remember, Ronnie, I mentioned uh, fear. I mentioned ambition. Yes. But there's a third factor, which I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't uh, mention. But now it's the time to mention it. implicit sectarianism. Hmm. I mean, you can, some of the most sectarian people I ever met in this country pretend to be secular or leftist or, or what have you. By the way, strictly speaking, speaking of that, the Ba'ath Party, uh, as, <laughs> as, as you know, it's a very secular party, right? It's, well. it's a very uh, anti-sectarian party, right? Wrong, actually. But um, stri- strictly speaking, yeah. uh, uh, it is. And so the Ba'ath phenomenon is actually not just restricted to Syria or Iraq. There's a Ba'ath culture whereby you could be the ultimate sectarian person in the room, but you just, you know, it's, it's fancy or it's convenient to talk in a very progressive or secular. Or, I'm, I'm mentioning this because if you happen to be, if someone happens to be a truly and deeply sectarian individual, right? Let's say that person is a Shia, for instance, and that person pretends to be sectarian, pretends to be um, secular. But deep down, she or he is sectarian. Then naturally, they would detest the Lebanese forces more than they would detest Hezbollah, because in their mind, that's the Christian side of the equation. So, and if they are Shia or they feel very deeply their Shia identity or a non-Christian identity or what have you, so they are naturally inclined to blame the Lebanese forces or at the very least to say, yes, Hezbollah is bad, but the Lebanese forces are as bad. That's, I think, what this is about is, above anything else, you know, a basic and an anti-Christian attitude or anti-Christian sectarianism that basically dilutes the responsibility of Hezbollah and is almost naturally inclined to blame the Lebanese forces or blame the Christian side for all the ills of, of the country. I don't have scientific yeah. uh, research here to offer, but I, I would put money down on this. Yeah. Uh, these are mostly Christian voices condemning the Lebanese forces mm. more than Hezbollah. Yeah. And they, I'm not, and of course it's not just Christian mm. against Christian. You have mm. everyone again. There's a, I, I've never heard the sectarian mm. explanation for it in mm. this way, which I, it's appealing. Mm. But I don't know if it's uh, coming from that side only. I sense that mm. this is almost a, uh, it's a deliberate balancing act to be acceptable. Mm. But it's a, it's a way out as mm. opposed to a way in. Meaning, if you do not insert the Lebanese forces mm. into every criticism of Hezbollah, yeah, amongst, your, yes. your regime supporter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So basically it's ideology. Hmm. It's, uh, it's a way to be accepted among certain, I don't know, pseudo-leftist circles. Call it whatever you want to call it. I mean, we can talk about this forever, trying to explain <laughs> why. But the basic point is, it is simply not true yeah. that there are you know, multiple militias in the country and Hezbollah is just one militia right. among others. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Samir Jara did not kill anyone after 1990. Uh, Walid Jumla did not kill anyone after 1990. Nabih Burri did not kill anyone after 1990. Okay, uh, people who are accused of assassinations are not. We know who they are. Yeah. Actually, we know which party is accused exactly. of assassinating. We know that. Uh, people who have missiles in this country, we know who they are. Mm-hmm. They are not the Lebanese forces. They are not Amal. They're not Hezbo Taqaddum al Okay, So let's just you know, stop pretending that there is no elephant in the room. There's a mammoth in the room. Okay? <laughs> there is a mammoth in the room. And if you deny that mammoth or try to dilute uh, that mammoth, um, first of all, good luck. But second of all, there's something deeply wrong with your approach to politics, both morally and intellectually. I'm glad this is flushed out this way because I think all 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 excuses don't add they don't make sense they don't mm. justify yeah, yeah. Uh, that kind of false equivalence. Yeah. Let's go into neutrality. Yeah. And I think uh, other than I'll say this without trying to sound mm. uh, like I I watch this all the time, mm. but other than that MTV lovely illustration of the goals of all of the above, sovereignty, mm. neutrality, yeah. and what we're going to get into, which is federalism, <clears throat> and the occasional 
patriarch uh, mm. speech, which is really recent. Mm. It's not sort of an old position. Um, and maybe on occasion, certain viewpoints that are not, they're not uh, at the front and center of Zoom discussions and panels and yeah. think tanks and all of the above. But you do see an increased appetite, at least to understanding what neutrality is. Um, I think it's still on the margin and it shouldn't be. Mm. I think this is something that deserves to be at the, in the middle of every discussion mm. because this country desperately needs neutrality. And yet I see, I read articles that treat neutrality as if it's uh, an implicit sectarian, anti-Palestinian, mm. discriminatory, prejudice mm. position. Mm. Or it's you have to choose between the Palestinians and the Israelis mm. Or you can't be principled and and neutral, and I to me it's that it all just sort of these are it echoes on social media, yeah. But it also does echo among academic, among in academia mm. and among think tank panels, panelists, and I think I even read at times almost uh, pa policy papers to ignore this issue altogether. Mm. And focus on economics. Mm. Don't talk about neutrality mm. now. So, it's for me. It's a. It's a very. It is a core issue. And I know from what I've read and what I've, I've I've watched you, and I understand it from your side also that it is a core issue. I would say it's the core issue. The core yeah, issue. Yeah. And maybe I can start by asking you a question about it. Mm. Do you do you think of the late 1950s, and let's say most of the 1960s? Mm. Whether it's for Edge Heb's eccentricities of letting Gemel Ab Gemel Nasser mm. meet him at the border mm. in that famous photo, or whether it's actually sparing Lebanon on the consequences mm. of 1967, mm. not one bullet fired. Yeah. Or for that matter, 1958 did not turn into a 15-year civil yeah. war. Yeah, or 1952, by the way. Or 1952. It, yeah. it was a 15-week mm. uh, crisis. crisis. Yeah. People died. But it's not 15 years where... Of bloodshed and barbarism, basically. And what we're living through still today. Yeah. So is that a fair assessment of that stretch of time? And if you can, maybe dissect exactly what we lost, that we cannot actually do this. That we're, not, we're not trying to be neutral. We're leaving it to the patriarch. Mm. And he should not be the one advocating this. should be... Everyone advocates. I'd say he shouldn't be the one alone advocating. Exactly, this. it mean, shouldn't be a yeah religious calling. Mm. It should mm. be a, the national desire. Mm. Listen, I think the church, whether in Lebanon or in multiple other countries, uh, many times uh, was the vessel mm. of expressing a national desire. The anti-communist resistance in Poland. The church played an important role. Solidarity, in, in these, yeah, yes, yeah, played an yeah. important role. Uh, so I am, I, of course, I'm a secular individual, and I don't like to see too much yeah. of you know priests and and church and sheikh intervening in, in politics. But I think when the patriarch is saying, "Look, this country is being slaughtered. This population is being driven to almost suicide," and truly something needs to be done about it, and that first thing is to let us be, meaning neutrality. I, you know, I don't see. That terribly problematic. By contrast, I see I saw it as extremely problematic when some so-called opposition movement, the moment the patriarch started calling yes. for neutrality, it became their light motive to say, well, the patriarch should not be intervening in politics or, in, or, or what have you. This is where I go back. I agree. Forgive me. Forgive they should me be wrong. supporting him. Yeah, absolutely. Let, let, let them do it. Yeah. Listen, I am, and that's central to my understanding of lots of dynamics in Lebanon. There's a lot of implicit sectarianism pretending to be um, secular and progressive and leftist and, and, and what have you. And there's a lot of modernophobia. There's a lot of like basic knee-jerk anti-Christian attitude. And I mean, let's think about it a bit. I mean, hating Jews was standard operating procedure in, in Christendom for decades and, and, and centuries. I mean, it was okay. I mean, if you read Tolstoy, for instance, you'll find profoundly anti-Semitic um, words or, or sentences or ideas. If you read Alexandre Dumas, 
I mean, these yes. are great writers, yeah. but they were great writers of the 19th century. Yeah. And especially Tolstoy, it's, it's a Russian 19th century. So, of course, you will find, you know, suffused anti-Semitism in lots of things uh, in, in his novels. Mm. I think we live in a region where hating the Christian is part of the culture. Uh, but again, few, these are Christian voices I see condemning. No, I actually, no, actually the people whom I saw, that they were more essentially, you know, rabid and, and that knee-jerk, anti batrak they were not Christians. Mm. That being said, mm. when you are a minority and you are surrounded by animosity, inevitably some part of the minority end up accepting the animosity directed at their group as a way to basically protect themselves or being accepted by the same people who are diffusing that hatred. So there's a lot of second-class citizens, who mean, uh, right, who basically accept um, what I find to be an unwise, knee-jerk, anti-Batrak, anti-Maronite church uh, um, attitude, who they themselves are Maronites or Christian. It doesn't mean that the basic drive behind this is not fundamentally sectarian. It's fundamentally, I would say, sectarian. Also, I think it's a misunderstanding of what laicity or misunderstanding of what secularism mm. is. Secularism does not mean that the Batrak does not have the right to say, hey, uh, Syrian, the Syrians are here, it's an occupation, and they need to leave. That's not, if, if the Batrak says that, it's not yani, you know, the biggest crime there is against uh, sectar against uh, secularism. I'm glad, now, yeah, yeah, yeah go I'm just going to interrupt. Go I, I like that you're, you're going back to this word, I've never heard it used in this context, yeah. that sectarianism is the explanation for this type of criticism. Yeah. And I think that's an, it's an interesting way of looking it's at a, it. An, it's one explanation. It's one explanation. There are multiple factors. Yeah. But I'm, I'm curious about, let's, let's, uh, let's bring him up yeah. in the context that he's one of the few mm. Lebanese figures, yeah. religious mm. or not, uh, talking about neutrality. Yeah. And in the 1960s, it seems to be a statewide endeavor. It's not yeah. the patriarch. Yeah. Or for that matter, it's not a Maronite issue. Or at least it doesn't seem to be as... Hardcore Maronite. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that even if... Um, even if that's how it's framed, mm. it's not necessarily the case. Patroni, may I, may I yeah, interrupt of course. you here? Yes, yes. Forgive me. I mean, each time the patriarch talks about sovereignty, right, and neutrality, the first Zaim, the first figure to immediately come to his defense, systematically, is Walid Jumplat. <laughs> you know, not exactly the most Maronite person there is, right? The last time the patriarch <laughs> also also <laughs> talked about neutrality. I mean, a few a few weeks ago, uh, Saad al Hariri uh, was there. So I mean, if there is a Maronite specificity here, it's that the Maronites or the Church are you know the first to talk about sovereignty. Oh, but I they're mean, not alone. I mean, yeah. automatically you find uh, Muslim Zaims saying actually we agree with that as well. So it's not as Maronite. As you think, there, there is a, there's basically people who take the lead in defending the country, but automatically you have Muslims and, and Muslim hot shots or Muslim you know, heavyweights, so to speak, uh, joining them in, in the good fight for the. When so, the, I mean, it's not as Maronite as, as, as you think it is. I don't see it that way. Oh, anymore. I completely yeah. agree. I don't yeah. think of it as a Maronite issue yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. I meant it more in the that these accusations are. I think you use the word maronophobia. Maronophobia, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I don't think it's a Maronite issue whatsoever. Yeah. I think yeah. this should be a Lebanese policy. Of course. Yeah, through and through. And I would rather the patriarch say it with conviction, and I sense he is, mm. maybe he's a bit late with it, mm. rather than Walid blood or Saad Hadid, yeah. who can easily go Flip. the other direction, <laughs> and they have many times yes, done that. Yes, of course. <laughs> so when Hadidi and Jumblat are doing it, but the patriarch did it earlier yeah. and means it, I would rather listen to the patriarch. Yeah. But that, that said, uh, in the 1960s, mm. do you, would you consider, mm. would you frame it as a sectarian issue that is applied towards other communities, meaning that this is a... I try what to are you talking about? Okay, so you say, I, I'm not sure okay, I so I, I don't think of neutrality as mm. a sectarian issue. No, of course not. In the 1960s, would you do you think that most Lebanese saw it that way? I'm not sure in the 1960s neutrality was, you know, 
or was it even discussed in that I, way? I, no, I, yeah. I don't, I'm not sure people are talking about neutrality. I mean, people mm. did mention neutrality. In the 1960s, basically, the big thing was Fatah. The big thing was, okay, we are all supportive of the Palestinian cause, but exactly what does that mean and how much leeway... Prior to Fatah's uh, arrival. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we're talking... Yeah. I mean, basically, Fatah came after... 19. They became big after 1967. Right. So by yeah. the late 1960s, mm. the question was big on the table. Mm-hmm. Okay, حريت العمل الفدائي or not? Should we allow the fedayeen to attack? Basically, straight to say it in a straightforward manner. That was the big question. Right. Should we allow the Palestinians to attack Israel using our borders and mm. if Israel counterattacks then okay we're going to pay the price or should we say look uh, uh, yes no, the Palestinians are our friends our neighbors whatever but that does not mean that we're going to uh, uh, destroy this country just to yeah. fully support so that was the dynamic at, at that time and yes at that time the, the Christians in general were the one saying, "Look, yes, we you know we understand the plight of the Palestinians, but that does not give the more the Palestinians any moral right to drag us into a war that clearly we cannot win and destroy the country in the process." Yeah, most voices arguing the opposite. Not all voices. Most voices arguing the opposite were Muslim voices. Yes, go ahead. But would, if you fast forward to today, yeah. do you think the reluctancy is there that it's born out of that conflict? Because no, I, I, I don't. I, I don't. Think, yeah. yeah no. Um, Hariri and Jumblat aside. Yeah. I don't hear neutrality as something that should. It, it, it's it's still on the margins. Mm. It's not. It's not a driving force of any discussion. And yeah, I think it um, should be. I think it's a, if you're right, it's a tragedy. It's a, but but is it's that a being, tragedy? Do you think it, it the hesitancy towards it goes yeah. back to, this is born out of the Palestinian. It's a fantastic question. Listen, Ronnie, I think there is a culture, among many in this country that Lebanon is not important per se. There's always like the, a big cause mm. that's always more important than Lebanon, whether it be it could be, you know, liberating Palestine or supporting our brethren in Algeria fighting against the French in the 1950s yes, right. or supporting, you know, Turkey now or supporting especially yeah. Iran or what have you. There's a culture that basically there's always some cause that is more important than ours. Ours is a petty uh, isolationist cause. And and thus we're going to always, you know, put any slogan or any uh, um, uh, argument in favor of Lebanon first. uh, Any Lebanon first attitude is bad, unprogressive, right-wing, whatever. And if I am truly a young revolutionary or, you know, a progressive or what have you, I should not talk too much from a Lebanese first or Lebanon first perspective because that's not cool or that's not progressive or that's not whatever. Mm. I completely, I, I am in full opposition mm. to this way of, of, of thinking. Uh, we are being crushed as a people. If you truly are a progressive, then you should be for the poor. You should defend the poor. You should v- defend the vulnerable. When Iran makes us our thing, when the economy collapses, who do you think is going to suffer first? The upper middle, middle class. The upper middle class Lebanese has a plan B. <laughs> the people who would suffer, and that basically means leaving, right? The people who would suffer first when the economy crumbles, when there's an ethnic conflict or a civil war or what have you, are the poorest sector of the population. Absolutely. So I cannot understand how on one hand, X, for instance, X would pretend to be on the left and a progressive. At the same time, X is very reluctant to say, look, Lebanon has suffered enough, mm. now let us be. What, who do you think is going to suffer first, Mr. Comrade, uh, uh, when, you know, uh, when, you know when, the, when the country collapses or when so, the state so collapses? So there's an ideological so, I mean, component what, here? Yeah, to, yeah, absolutely. That, that is an, anti-neutrality in that yes, sense? Yes, yeah. anti-neutrality, because neutrality basically means we're putting the national interest of Lebanon first, mm. right? And some people are, historically, they're just not comfortable with this idea. There's always, I was talking to a young person not long ago, and basically he, he would say, why was he anti neutrality? Because um, he, he would say, the Saudi regime is, a, is an autocratic regime, and we have a duty to help you know, our, Saudi, our Saudi friends to clamor for democracy in, in, in Saudi Arabia. I don't think we have a duty for that. We have a duty to defend the national interest of Lebanon. If the Saudi regime is a friendly regime to Lebanon, 
even though the Saudi regime is not as a, as a autocratic regime inside, that will not prevent me or should not prevent me from having normal relations with the Saudi regime if that essentially serves the national interest of Lebanon. For that matter, I mean, normal relations with Iran. Do not, I am, that do I am, not destroy Lebanon. Yeah, I am for normal relations with yeah. Iran. The problem is, is Iran for normal yeah, relations exactly. with Lebanon. Yeah. So it's a yeah, principle yeah, of yeah. disassociate yes. yourself from regional yeah. problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the Ba'abda declaration yeah. in 2012, do you think of that as a serious no. policy? No. Okay, and let's go there as much as you'd like, because yeah. I know it's a bit, it, it's funny. It's not outdated, and at the same time, it feels like it's centuries ago. Yeah. It's less than a decade yeah. uh, that all groups nominally agree that they should not get involved in the Syrian war. Yeah. Even Hezbollah. Boy, did that work. <laughs> the, maybe, what is it, a few minutes later? Yeah, they're in Syria. Of course, yeah. yeah. But the fact that they even felt the need to agree in principle, yeah. is that the domestic push and as far as it can go that's for the, neutrality? That's the Lebanese political theater. You know, there's nothing um, intellectually compelling about it, or morally compelling about but it. But let's say even the yeah. the drive to try to do this in the local way, yeah. without regional consideration, yeah. is that as far as it can go in the Lebanese context? Yeah, yeah I would say it's as far uh, slogan eating, basically. We're very good at slogan eating, and mm. yes, that's exactly how far it would go. No, I mean, the, which brings me back running to my leitmotiv, to my fundamental idea, right? Absent sovereignty, nothing else is going to happen. Yeah. Like we could meet in Babda and say we're not going to intervene in Syria, right? And as you accurately said, accurately said, five minutes later, some of us are rushing to intervene in Syria, and nobody can prevent them from doing so. Why? Because there's no functioning state. Right. Why? Because these people are a state within the state. Why? Because Iran still can, still is the overlord. Yes. As long as this is the case, forget about you know declaration of good intentions in Baghdad. Yeah. Forget about federalism. Forget about social justice. Nothing is going to happen as long as we are just one sad, dysfunctional battlefield Lebanon. Uh, where all the battles for influence can be waged and where basically Iran calls the shot. That's our fundamental and main problem. That's the gateway. I'm not saying that's the only problem. Right. You know? yeah. But that's the gateway to solve all other problems we are suffering from. So right before we get to federalism, which yeah. is, I think you're the person to ask that question in its entirety, but one last point about yeah. neutrality. Do you think that a regional application mm. is necessary for it to take hold. And I'll ask it in a mm. way that you can compare. Mm. Um, it's hard for me to imagine uh, the Balkans mm. having recovered in a way that meets geopolitical considerations mm. without violence, mm. without heavy-handed pressure, mm. whether it's from the Americans and the Russians, yeah. the Europeans as well, that something unthinkable, Kosovo, comes to mm. fruition mm. and Serbia is not invading. And both countries have to have a foreign policy that is conducive mm. to European Union yeah. uh, acceptance. And you see it happening slowly, sluggish, but these countries are not taking sides in war. Yeah. And they're not fighting each other. Austria has a treaty of neutrality and the Soviets and the Americans spare that country from the Cold War, yeah. it survived. Vienna was not a demarcation line. It's as quiet as it ever was, and it remains as quiet as it will always be Vienna, a quiet city. Northern Ireland required the Americans, the British, and the Europeans to a lesser degree mm. to at least figure out a way that makes sense so that Northern Ireland is not a battlefield yeah. and that it becomes part of its past. Yeah. Violence ends... And you can go on and on. There's many examples sure. here. But that's regional posturing. That bigger players... Apply, agree. Yeah. They agree and they, uh, when they need to, it's a hands-off policy that mm. we're not going to get involved here. Mm. We agree to not get involved. Yeah. Is that what is at stake when it comes to neutrality? Yeah, I mean, I would say the way I imagine this happening, first of all, uh, the Lebanese themselves need to agree on, on, on this. And that doesn't mean that every single individual in the four million Lebanese need to agree on this. But we need to create uh, a public opinion mm. um, pushing strongly 
in favor of neutrality. Then we need to talk to our friends abroad. And that's not the regional complex. When I say abroad, I basically mean... Lebanese abroad? Or no, I basically mean about the liberal democracies abroad. Oh, I see. I um, see. That uh, can, for reasons of their own, I mean, politics are determined by interests. But I don't see why a neutral Lebanon would be something that is unacceptable from a French perspective. Right. Or unacceptable from you know an American perspective. Mm-hmm. So essentially, if you have a nexus between strong, organized Lebanese, on one hand, pushing in favor of neutrality. And on beyond the, the patriarch. Hand, beyond the, the patriarch. Political, pa- patriarch plus other. Pa- yeah. Call it patriarch plus, right? <laughs> yes. Let's call it this. Let's put it this way. Yeah. Okay, on the one hand. Mm. On the other hand, you have, say, the Vatican helping us dis- discreetly, a la Vatican, right? <laughs> to push this agenda forward, yeah. right? And then we end up having, you know, an internal... Pressure in favor of neutrality plus Western or Occidental, you know, sympathy at least for the cause. Then you can talk to the players in the region. Hey, you know, this country is you know off mark. By the way, so it has there's, to be there's a president first. Yeah, first. I mean, yeah. everything has to be inside first. Yes. By the way, uh, there's a president for this. I mean, the Mutasarrifia yes. basically was protected by some kind of an agreement mm-hmm. between the major powers at the time, you know, Russia, Prussia, Austria-Hungary, uh, France, uh, the UK, and Italy, and they forced basically on the Ottoman Empire some kind of arrangement that guaranteed uh, the neutrality of Lebanon and stability in Lebanon for 70 years. There's a good book about it called The Long Peace by a Turkish historian, Enjin Akarli. So, I mean, had it not been for the First World War, Uh, it would have, you know, the neutrality and stability in Lebanon could have continued. So there is a precedent for some kind of like an international umbrella Mm. around Lebanon telling the regional actors, you know what, you stop here. Things stop on the borders of Lebanon. I would like that to be reproduced. Of course, history never repeats itself uh, completely. Mm. But in the general outline of things, some kind of national, Lebanese national consensus around neutrality, on one hand. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, uh, uh, an international consortium to basically guarantee the neutrality of Lebanon could work. If you were to just go back to the 1960s, before the You're obsessed with the 1960s, are you not? I I, I am. (laughs) You know why? It's because I can't think of another experience in this country where echoes of neutrality or shadows of it were... Around yeah, that Mutasarrifi is um, not the modern it's Lebanon. Too old. We, yeah. It's too old, and it's yeah. not the Lebanon that we yeah, 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 think sure, of. Sure. So yeah, it's, it's Mount Lebanon. It's yeah. Mount Lebanon. I'm from Mount Lebanon, and sometimes yeah, we, we tend to confuse. Yeah. But you're right, you know. But I, I can't think of another time where it, this was an inward yeah. policy that was acceptable to regional players. Mm. So that Abdel Nasser doesn't show up in 1959 mm. in the country. He's at the border. Yeah, and that to me seems to be the recipe that it's yeah. agreed. And Lebanon makes sure of it. Yeah. Uh, and, now, that being said, the price for that was that Fuad Shab or Lebanon at the time... Is a military... Had, no, no, no. Mm. Had to follow the Egyptian lead in, in major Arab quarrels. You know, the Egyptians were, were uh, jockeying for supremacy. Mm. Uh, first, of course, against uh, the Hashemites of, of Iraq. Yes. And then right. later on, of course, against the Baathis of Syria and the Baathis. I mean, it's, yeah. and the Baathis of Iraq. That's a fascinating mm. and a very complex... Uh, there's, a, there's a word for it, the Arab Cold War. Um, and and uh, the price for Nasser not messing too much with internal politics was that in, the ex- in, in, in you know, foreign policy, Lebanon agreed at the time to right. follow the lead of, of Egypt, which Lebanon did. So... Oops. That's why I have battery. We're still filming. No, oh, okay. <laughs> welcome no, to I'll, Lebanon. Welcome to Lebanon. Hello. Come. But you know what? It's uh, it shouldn't happen. I mean, we are. There what? we go. That's the magic of being in this country, right? That's the magic of being close to the presidential palace. Oh, this is why. Of course. It, it, yeah. That's why it comes back. Yeah, it comes back yes. I get I get eight <laughs> hours a day only. I'm not Khayel, drenched. Khayel, at the, uh, I am opposed to Aoun, that Mr. Aoun guarantees. Electricity almost all day long, and yet I am in the opposition. <laughs> Is that the principal position or not? <laughs> it's a bit of both. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and you know what? I could use more electricity, so maybe this is the building. 
<laughs> no, but I, I'm I'm sorry if I go back no, to no, that no, decade too much, but I I just find that to be an, an exceptional period in Lebanese mm. history. I like the fifties actually. Uh, the fifties as well. Yeah, and that it all seems to just disappear after yeah. that. So yeah. for me, that's the goal. Yeah, is to pick up where you leave off. Yeah, and that seems to be. The, those two decades. Yeah, I would say, I mean, the, the, the beginning of the end of what used to be Lebanon or the beginning of La Descente aux Enfers, you know, yes. um, was 1969. Right. And, I mean, what was that an instance of? It was an instance of allowing the international dynamics, basically welcoming the international and regional dynamics in. Right. And yeah. the more regional dy- dynamics we allow in, uh, the more polarization we have, it's almost a sign. You know, this keeps repeating itself in almost scientific precision. Absolutely. The more we invite in the regional struggles for power, and the more likely the Lebanese are going. The relations between the Lebanese are going to be polarized, and at the end of that polarization, uh, it's civil war. It, this keeps repeating itself yeah. in a scientific precision. So basically, what we want is the exact opposite. Keeping the regional dynamics out. Now, something I wanted to say, Ronnie, which I didn't do. Um, If Lebanon is neutral, that would not prevent you, you, Ronnie, from basically going on CNN if you are interviewed and saying, you know, I support the legitimate rights of the Palestinians. So we need to make a separation between, you know, the official position of the state and how much the state would allow itself or the country to be dragged into regional, you know, polarized dynamics, and yeah. the individual right of every one of us to basically say whatever she or he wants to say. And the so, human dignity of yeah, half yeah, a million of Palestinians yes. that are treated... Yes, like second-class citizens in their own land. Yeah. You know, we could still talk... And in our... And in ours yeah. as well. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. yeah. And we deserve... Uh, I think that's the conversation, not the, not the regional policy. It yeah. should be... What we've done to this. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, one thing I find intriguing is typically the people who are most, you know, uh, loud in defending the Palestinians could not care less about what's going on to the Palestinians in the camps. I mean, it's probably easier to help the Palestinians in Lebanon than to help the Palestinians in in Gaza, right? Absolutely. And we've been living in a Hezbollah-dominated country for 30 years, and the Palestinians are suffering more, although the supposed champion of the Palestinian cause is the biggest player in the country. Go figure. These two issues, sovereignty and neutrality, feed into federalism. Federalism, okay. So why, first of all, what is federalism? Well, I'm going to give you the floor yeah but if i can ask you just a simple question mm. is this word debatable yeah. meaning meaning it's not a one flavor form of oh, absolutely absolutely and and that you can find varieties that would work for lebanon as well absolutely it's, okay so i'll Listen, give you the floor. i mean that you basically you you hit the nail on the head here because one of the first things I ever said about federalism is that there is no federalism. There are federalisms <laughs> in the sense that the federalism federalism in America is different from federalism in you know Belgium. And federalism in, in Belgium is very different than federalism in, in Switzerland, yes. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we need to do is to find the you know uh, our own federalism, the one that you know, suits us best. That, that's it. So yes, there are multiple flavors to, to the term. Uh, Let me define it in a simple way. Please. Federalism is essentially (coughs) political, uh, administrative, and financial decentralization. Federalism allows people living in different regions to make their own decisions, to make their own decisions pertaining to to the local economy, to the local university, to local schools. In fact, it allows the concept of a local economy mm. or a local school or local university or a local ethos, what have you. For instance, I'm personally when I when I you know when when I wanted to get married, I um, you know I married my wife in Hawaii, and we <laughs> we I mean our, ours was a. I civ- was really uh, imagining uh, you were going to go full Lebanese here, yeah. and we had no. you know the full no he went he went to paradise. Basically, it was. <laughs> It was us on a beach yeah. with a lot of aloha and <laughs> yeah. flowers and what have you. Anyway, point is, it was a civil wedding, right? Right. Yeah. Um, what if, what if, Ronnie, 
there's a majority in metal today or shuf alay, whatever, uh, uh, that would want civil wedding in metal, mm-hmm. right? It cannot be done in a central state. Right. Everybody needs to agree. And yeah. then you could have civil wedding, right? Yeah. Or civil marriage in, in Lebanon. What if we have a federal country whereby if there is a majority in, in Tripoli or in Nabati uh, against civil marriage, then in Tripoli or in Nabati or wherever, you don't do civil marriage. But if there is a majority for a civil marriage and say Shuf, then you, you can go to the Shuf. And why do we need to go to Cyprus? You know, so but to, to be able to have that kind of flexibility, right, you need local governments because a civil wedding requires a law, right? As long as you have a centralized state, then you have one law for, for the state, right? And right. there's nothing you can do about it. By contrast, what you could have, what we are imagining, is a, is a, is a system that would allow local governments and local parliaments to have their own laws for a specific region of, of Lebanon and let them decide, for instance, if they want in their region civil marriage or not or how much taxes they want to basically take impose on the population or how, more importantly, how they're going to spend their taxes. So this is, all these things are allowed by federalism. But so I don't think, I think I still failed to tell you why I think federalism is, is, is important, why I'm an no, opponent. No, yeah. we'll get there. Yeah. But yeah. you're just listing, mm. I think, the desires of most of us mm. in a very practical way. Yeah. And it's almost um, it's a simpler, more straightforward way of addressing local concerns yeah. that is peaceful yeah. and doesn't intrude on other communities' concerns. Yeah. Why is this still, even with that kind of uh, explanation, mm. why is this a heated debate? Why, why is it a, and I hope I don't mean to say to sound condescending, that it was mostly on the fringe of the de- of the debate. It's increasingly moving become, to the center, and I think it's moved to the center because of your voice and others mm. who have been able to deliver it better. Mm. I think, mm. but why is this still a? There's emotions involved. Listen, I think I am. Forgive me for repeating myself, but that's a variable that explains a lot of things. Sectarianism. Implicit sectarianism. Implicit sectarianism. Implicit sectarianism. Hidden sectarianism. A sectarianism that does not want to to say its name. The moment when you say federalism, historically Christian parties were proponents of federalism. Some people have a knee-jerk reaction against anything modernite. It's just just a fact. And we can debate that, but I, I feel, unfortunately, it's part of our culture and it's part of our politics. So one dimension is a knee-jerk, immediate sectarianism. Of course, the other dimension, which is also sectarian, it is this. Uh, federalism makes the game of demographic weights null. You know, if you are, I mean, you lived, right, en- you yeah. lived, you lived enough in, in, of course you know that, because you lived so, for so long in, in, in America. Um, California is a mega state from a demographic perspective. You're right? going back to our off that, the record. Con- yeah, yeah, like it's true. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Dakota yeah. is not. Yeah, yeah. Right? Dakota is not. Yeah. South Dakota, North. They're not. Yeah. Yet both or the, all these states are represented in just two senators. Right. In in the it does not matter because yes. the idea of federalism is like you know uh, we are going to be represented equally. We are all in this together. Yep. Now, if you are implicitly a sectarian individual and you're thinking look i'm like 80 percent or 70 percent of this country right why should i allow allow the minority um equal representation than me and i know very well that federalism would allow exactly that let's let's go down this road so i mean if this is how you're thinking yeah then you automatically would be anti-federal so i mean so i mean there are other variables ideology what have you but i would say the variable with the biggest weight is knee-jerk immediate sectarian anti-christian attitude that that would push a lot of people to be anti anti federal. Now no. the the other variables include uh, not understanding the idea well, mm, mm. Uh, fear of the unknown, um, uh, the uh, if you will the the historical weight uh, of federalism because this idea was you know first came to the fore uh, during the war, and so when you say federalism, a right. lot of people imagine uh, 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 Lebanese forces checkpoint yes. with people asking you whether you're Christian or Muslim yeah. or, or what have you. 
Um, there's ideology. So mm. there's a lot of things that would account for why people sometimes have this immediate rejection of, of the idea. But I would say two things. The main variable is still knee-jerk sectarianism. And the other thing is, the idea is not only, not only could work for Lebanon, but I'll tell you, and I'm telling you this as a political scientist, a country as diverse as ours cannot be run efficiently from within the confines of a centralized government. It's, 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 a, it's a break of any basic rule of politics. It's a break of any basic rule of sane thinking to think that you can run Belgium or you can run Switzerland, or you can run Ethiopia, or you can run uh, Nigeria, or India, or Lebanon. Or the United States. Or the United States, for that matter. Yeah. Uh, within the confines. Canada. Of, yeah. yeah. And the yeah. list is long. Yeah. yeah, the list, of course. Uh, these are, I mean, ours is a um, uh, heterogeneous society par excellence. <laughs> par excellence, right? <laughs> heterogeneous societies on a structural level should mean some kind of political decentralization on the institution level. Again, it's almost scientific precision. Uh, but, you know... But, I, I'm glad but, you've, you've emphasized... I, I'm glad you're doing it because I don't hear that angle enough yeah. that there's this prejudice, yeah. implicit or not, towards one community, the yeah. way you're describing yeah. it, that shelves these topics too quickly yeah. from the table. Yeah. And I'm glad you're, fi you're finding, I think, the, the, the more accurate reflection... Mm of why these topics are there to begin with yeah. and why they should be discussed, yeah. with or without that prejudice yeah. in mind. But let, let's, let's go... There's two things I want to ask you before we get into why you yeah. personally think yeah. it, it, it's the way out. Uh, I like the reference to this U.S. Senate mm. that a m mammoth sized state mm. like California mm. or a little f sort of goldfish in a, you know, <laughs> somewhere in the corner... In the uh, pond. <laughs> yeah, Rhode Island or yeah. Minnesota or, or Dakota, yeah. North Dakota, South... These are states that have very small populations. Yeah. But they feel secure. Yeah. And like you said, it's two senators from each state. Yeah. And that's how America works. Yeah. And voila. House of Representatives is not based that way. Yeah. It may not be perfect... But ideally, it's merit-based, mm. and the numbers match populations as best as mm. possible. But the Senate is both merit-based and unequal yeah. in representation. I can imagine that being something so good for Lebanon mm. that the implicit sectarianism is put in its rightful chamber. Yeah. And that you can allow for a parliament that functions better, mm. that is not so confessional and mm. quota, yeah. and is hopefully more merit-based mm. over time. But that is still centralized. Mm. Is, that a, is that also too central for you? In that yeah, it's too central for me. Mm. I'll tell you why. I would like to have local governments. Listen, Rani, what is the function of the government in Lebanon? It's not to put a public policy. The function of any government, any given government in Lebanon, is to basically make sure that all factions are represented. And once they are represented, they can use the fact that they are in power to satisfy a clientele. So that clientele votes for them again in the election. And this cycle repeats itself ad nauseum on mm -hmm. and on and on again. There's no, I don't know, like five terms plan for national education, you know, or like 10 years agenda for, I don't know, Lebanese industry or what have you. Now, what I would like is for that to change. And how could that change? I would say if you take functions pertaining to the economy and development and what have you from the central state where everybody, all the communities, all the big parties need to be represented, and then you would allow, let us say, the government in Pshari to take that to take care of that in Pshari, mm. then in Pshari, you will have, with some time, opposition and a government, and the government will be required. People will tell the government, look, maybe like 60 or 70 percent of our taxes are going to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, now show me the electricity. Okay, show me yeah. the jobs, show me the education. And if you don't have them, then it's not a big deal to vote them out. Okay, let us say. So in our current system, like some guy in Zgharta 
is unhappy with the Ministry of Education. Yeah. Uh, but the Ministry of Education happens to be, you know, the realm of Harakat Amal, the Shia party. Please explain to me how much power uh, a citizen who happens to be a Marmat from Zgharta has over the decision making of Harakat Amal. I would say zero. So th- that's yeah. the core problem um, there. That yeah, I think one big core problem that we have yeah. is that our government, governments are made a priori mm. uh, to rule in the name of a certain plan. Yeah. And then the electorate can vote them in or back to power or out of power according to whether they're good enough at exe- executing their plan. That's not how our government functions. Mm-hmm. Our government is just to make sure that all the communities are there, okay, all the big parties are there. Oh, by the way, that basically means that the people in the parliament are the same people in the government. So good luck for yeah, you know right. the, the MP from Harakit Amal uh, to do something about whatever wrong the minister from Harakat exactly. Amal is doing, or or Mustaqbal, or Auni, or whatever. But let me. I don't want that. Let's take yeah. that out of the central, and let's let's say okay, Shuf Ali, or Kisarwain, or Nabati, or what have you. Now in the Wilayat Nabati, there's going to be a government of Nabati, and you're not going to put an Uwait guy in the government of Nabati. There's no Uwait, or very few Uwait. There's going to be just the local factions of Nabati competing against other local factions of, of Nabati. So I, you're taking the yeah, regional yeah. dimension out, and you're taking the identity dimension out, and you're just saying, look, Nabati folks, it's up to you. I have a very silly yeah. example, but this is one that sticks with me. Yeah. Tripoli, yeah. in the 1940s, yeah. 1950s, uh, you have Kate'ib sports clubs yeah. that are thriving. Yeah. Uh, and the politics of Kate'ib, mm. even if they become maybe perhaps limited over time, and then they get involved in war mm. to a degree. No, not to a degree. No, no, I mean, sentiment. sorry. In the early 1970s, yeah. that pre-war, they were already yeah. losing their, uh, their political uh, edge. They became more mm. militia-like mm. before the war. But going back in time, you have a political party that can persuade people in Tripoli Maybe not many, maybe, but but we still, you, I mean, it's not, let me ask it in a better way. Is it impossible to imagine parties that could have evolved better in Lebanon so that, whether it's Future or Ahmed or all the ones that we know, that they would have eventually found that national aspiration? Why, listen. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll ask Why can't we imagine a federal party, right? With a wing in Kisarwe and a, a wing in, in Tripoli and a wing in Nabati. Now these wings does not have to do not have to be one hundred percent the same, right? But but uh, on the national level they agree on a general narrative and on local level they could be a bit more liberal here, a bit more conservative there, depending on how you know local politics function. For instance, you know, Ronnie, going back to our American example. You know, the Democrats in California are very different from the Democrats, say, in Texas. Because if you're going to have any chance of winning anything in Texas, you cannot be a California liberal. You could be, uh, you'll have to be a Texas liberal, yeah. whatever that. All the Texas and liberal should not be <laughs> put in the same, in the same sentence. Yeah, but the ex- but you, see, yeah. you see what I mean. Sure. I mean, uh, if you're a Democrat in Vermont, uh, being anti-gun is not going to do you any good. Mm-hmm. So you have to be very careful. You can yeah. be a socialist you, in Vermont yeah, and but, be gun-friendly. But can, yeah, and gun-friendly. Yeah. But if you are uh, in California, you can be an anti Gun, right. right. uh, Democrat, and you can still win, win elections. So yeah. we could imagine yeah. within a federal Lebanon multiple multiple parties, all of them, you know, with multiple tentacles, so to speak, all over the country. And this is how I could see that happening and and that working. Then let me challenge yeah. you on this question. Yeah. And I, this is an amateur take yeah. on it because I'm not. I'm sure it's not. Go <laughs> ahead, please. Do you think violence? Prevented what could have been a healthier political model. I think foreign intervention, above anything else, prevented what began. Let's not, you know, let's not forget, Ronnie, in the, you know, the first coup d'état in the Arab East happened in Iraq in 1936. So coup d'états began in the 1930s. First in Iraq, 
then in Syria, then in Egypt, and then they were all over the place. And with coup d'etats, you had the armies intervening in politics, and then you had military dictators, and then hell broke loose, basically. While all that was happening in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, all the way to the 70s, Lebanon was thriving economically. Now, there were inequality in distribution. Sure. But, but there was a healthy economy, a growing economy. A growing economy. Yeah. There was growth. Yeah. On one hand, you had political freedoms. You had freedoms of all kinds, actually. Uh, you had a multi-party system. You had a lot of... You, you had, of course, AUB. You had USG. You had a solid educational system. Yeah. You had a lot that, with time, could have helped you manage the diversity better. However, what prevented that from happening, what broke our back, basically, was the regional dynamics inviting themselves... To Lebanon, right, and this but is where hell broke loose. Like I agree with that, and mm. but I'm, I'm maybe I I'm looking at it more that federalism, the mm. way you're describing it. Mm. Uh, do you think that was a necessity even in the pre? Oh yeah, years? yeah, yeah. No, I think Lebanon when, when so basically the Maronite Church mm. had I been you know the uh, conciliere of the patriarch or uh, uh, the you know the a friend of the patriarch 1920s. I'll tell him you have two choices. A, you do not create. Grand Liban. You keep, you know, small Lebanon. You may, you may add Beirut to it, for instance, uh, or Beirut plus the Beka, but you do not create Grand, uh, Grand Liban. Or B, if you do want to create Grand Liban, immediately, immediately go for Federal. one neutrality above mm. anything else, neutrality, mm. Mm. and second, some kind of neutralism to allow you know, the different countries, a different, a different part of the country to sell through, basically. So from, from day one, we needed neutrality. And from day one, we needed federalism. Mm -hmm. We never had either, which is why, my friend, if you look back at the history of this country, it's one civil war after another civil war, one occupation after another occupation, especially from the 1960s onward. So again, Ronnie, I'm, I'm, as a political scientist, I tell you, you know, heterogeneous society should not slash cannot be run effectively from within the confines of a centralized government. That's just wrong. That's wrong. That's like saying 1 plus 1 equals 11. You know, that's like despising and ignoring any basic rules of math what, or of science. What, yes. is, what a potential center, one that doesn't exist, mm. but one that's been on the table for so long, mm. would it at least help alleviate some of the concerns you're describing? Not if the uh, executive power remains mm. what it is now. Right. I fear if the executive power remains what it is now. Basically, if the, uh, the general outlines of the system remain what they are, mm. we're just yeah. as Senate, we're basically giving the Lebanese bosses, I don't know, like another hundred seats to fill with their clientele. Right. That's it. So that's that, it. that doesn't address what you would nothing. describe as the core. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. The core problem, above anything else, is the lack of neutrality. Above anything else, what we need for this country is for the regional dynamics to stay out. That's the core problem. I share that sentiment fully. Okay. And I think I enjoy the debates on the issues that should be debated mm. without fear of violence. Yeah. And I think neutrality is the way out of our political violent... Yeah, our, yeah, yeah. Or the death of politics in this country. Yeah, yeah. I completely yeah. agree. Yeah, I think, you know, even even with neutrality, there would still be, you know, political crises from time to time. But the political crisis is one thing. Mm -hmm. An escalation to full civil war is a different thing. Absolutely. Uh, the problems in Lebanon do not escalate into a full-scale civil war absent a foreign intervention, right? So it's basically internal problems plus foreign intervention equals civil war and violence. Right. If somehow you can stop the second part of the equation, you mm -hmm. can keep it out, basically, then the first part of the equation in itself does not lead you to civil war. I give you an example, Ronnie, a quick example. 1952 and 1958. Yes. In right. 1952, yeah. you had a president who basically wanted to stay president, who was, who should have stopped being president in 1949. Mm -hmm. So he had outstayed his welcome, so to yes. speak, yeah. or his mandate by three years, and he wanted more. 1958, you had another president who was, who was also thinking of doing yeah. the same, right? Okay, so you had a, cri a crisis in here, and you had a crisis in there. And the players in the game were almost the same. You have Shamoun, Jmeyel, Jumblat, etc. The difference is, in 1952, you had Athaur al-Baydaq. 
you did not have yeah. a civil war. In 1950, we had, you had 1958, you had a mini civil war. Yeah. What explains the difference? So at the same time, I mean, in, in both cases, you had a crisis built around uh, the ambition of a president who wanted to, be, to remain president. Right. You had the same elite, everything was the same, same country, everything the same, same decade, yep. right? But, but with, in one case, 1958 became a civil war, 1952 was not. And I would say the variable that explains the difference is that by 1958, you had the rise of Nasserism. Yes. Yeah. So you had basically a far more polarized yeah. regional environment, and that regional environment was invited to intervene in, in Lebanon and then held broken. Had it been, had Lebanon been neutral in 1958, I would say uh, we would not have gone to war in 1958. Those are the parts I should just keep in. <laughs> and then subtitles below, you know. <laughs> and I These viewers. Yeah. No, I appreciate the re I appreciate real things that yeah, happen. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, that's yeah, real. Yeah. I have a family. Yeah. I'm curious about yeah. your your own intellectual journey. Yeah. And I I'll ask this in a way I hope it resonates with yeah. you. Uh, I, I I suppose we're not that far apart in age. Yeah. I'm guessing you're a bit older than me. Yeah. Or mid-40s, late-40s. 43. 43. So we're not that far apart. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you've read a lot of books. <laughs> That's what I do for a living. That's <laughs> what you do. You've written a book. Yeah. Uh, you have... You're a political scientist, mm. which means that you have probably had this ambition for a long time. At curiosity. Least the, the intellectual curiosity, mm. Yeah. Pursuing a PhD yeah. in any subject requires that. Yeah. Um, it took me time, mm. I think, to come to my own persuasion mm. in the Lebanese story. Yeah. And I think it was an, it evolved. And I'm wondering, in your case, at least what you're associated with now, whether it's an advocacy for neutrality or championing something like federalism or making it more understood, better understood, uh, discussing sovereignty when many people do not, but you're you're doing it. Did this was this with you from day one on your journey, or is this something that it just it, it's a conclusion to what you were reading, what you were experiencing, that maybe you felt other ways earlier, and that now you see it this way. Hmm. And from my side, I think it gradually ended up in this direction. Not the federalism part so much, but more that Lebanon lost something so important and without reestablishing it, it's a lost cause. Sovereignty is the big thing. Neutrality is equally important. Yeah, it's and the other side of it. Other yeah. side of it. But it wasn't striking to me at the beginning. I think it took time. Maybe that's life experience. Mm -hmm. But if any of that resonates with you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you some things or a basic attitude remains the same, mm. and some things change. A basic attitude is an ideological commitment mm. to Lebanon. I was right. never um, a Qawmi Arabi, okay? I was never a Qawmi Suri. I was never uh, a communist or what have you. So yeah. my identity ha has always been Lebanese, mm. and I'm committed to the national interest of my country and of my people. Okay, so that did not change. That was true when I was 15, and mm. that is true mm. now. And my guess is this is going to be very true when I die. Huh. So that's that will not change. Yep. I'm not going to become an internationalist. I'm not going to become uh, a unionist of any kind. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm a Lebanese. Yeah. Uh, now I'm a liberal Lebanese. When I say I'm a Lebanese, it does not mean that I believe there's some kind of like superior Lebanese race right. or that kind of BS, yeah. or that you know that you know the Phoenicians and we are all descended from the Phoenicians and the Phoenicians are better than the Arabs. And I mean that's I just laugh when when I hear that. Yeah. That's not what I mean. Yeah. I'm just I am a Lebanese. I belong to this population. I belong to Grand Liban. And I am committed to the national interest of my country, especially that I see how much violence uh, and humiliation and suffering have been visited upon my people, and I am outraged. 
when I see so many suffering. I'm outraged when I hear and see so many Lebanese are committing suicide. Suicide, for crying out loud. The Lebanese are committing suicide. Some of us are committing suicide because of the situation. I am morally outraged and I feel very, very deep empathy for you know, my country, for this population. These are you know, my fellow countrymen. I cannot, I cannot but feel sympathy for them. Now, you may tell me, yes, but there are people suffering in Argentina. You know, God bless them. I mean, they have my, you know, my moral support, <laughs> my moral support, but I like my own. I'm not, te- I'm not telling you I only like my own, but I do tell you I like my own first, and my own are the Lebanese, and that, you know, that basic attitude did not change. Other things change. I'm going to tell you mm, about them, yeah. but you seem to have a question. So no, okay. I, I, I mean, it's like, it's almost a mirror reflection of how I've imagined yeah. my own life here, yeah. and then the way you're referencing 1920, that's what you belong to, it's what I belong to. It's yeah. the greater Lebanon yeah. that was born from us, it was also born from war, yeah. born from European mandatory intervention, yeah. but it was born nonetheless. Maybe it doesn't always walk on its own two feet, but that's the thing that I attach myself yeah. to. Yeah. Uh, and for me, other things sort of evolved over time, but federalism is something new to me, at least in the Lebanese context. Mm. Even though, and you mentioned this before, which is true, I spent a good chunk of my life in a federal state, yeah. in the United States, yeah. in different states, different governments. Mm. Um, I know what federalism is, and to me it's not a toxic word. Mm. And Lebanon, I think it was unfairly treated as something unnecessarily emo- emotive. But does that word shift with you over time? Is that something that you come to later? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wasn't necessarily uh, pro-federalism all my life. Mm. I mean, I mm. was pro-federalism uh, um, at an early age, uh, but I didn't necessarily, you know, when I was 15, I was not. You know, You're not like that's yeah, the yeah, yeah. yeah that's like you know that's uh, <laughs> uh, the goal of my life is right. no no but at 15 I was already you know I love Lebanon and I you know that's my identity yeah. and that's my cause nothing yes. else yeah. okay okay now um, so that that's that's the basic you know if you want ideological drive yeah. or, or emotional attitude now what did change I came to understand bit by bit because you know I was a product of the 1980s first right, right. so I grew up in the war. Yeah. I came to understand I'm not the only one who likes Lebanon. Christians are not the only one who like, who oh, like Lebanon. Yes. So the idea of Lebanese patriotism yeah. is not a modernite only product or a Christian only product. Mm. But for, I mean, I couldn't have come to that conclusion in 1989, not just because I was 11 there, uh, but because you know, at the time, uh, the other was basically a bomb uh, yeah. uh, basically hitting my neighbors. I mean, the other was basically a militia yeah. shooting at me, right? right. Yeah. I mean, I didn't have, growing up, uh, um, going to school, I don't have a colleague who was a Muslim throughout the 1980s because of the war. Yeah. You know, I began discovering, you know, uh, uh, Lebanese Muslims basically after the war and not immediately after the war because it took some time, you know, for yeah. people to start mingling and what have you. So th- some things changed and then 2005 mm, was a big yes. turning point yeah. uh, because I was on the streets all the time. I was, in, you know, mingling with people and that was a beautiful, beautiful moment of uh, Lebanese history and in my mind it was a turning point. Because that day I understood, you know, truly, truly, Lebanese-ness is not restricted to one community supposedly defending it all the time, and then other communities are, all of them, all the time, necessarily hostile to it. And then there's something that I want to confess. There is, in, in that political catastrophe that is, that is called Aounism, there is one silver lining. It's your electricity. Yeah, there is one silver lining. I came, I understood that Maronites could betray Lebanon too, which is not something that I was ready to accept before. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Oh, so this, so that's so post-2005. Um, yeah, so I, uh, post-2005, I came to the conclusion, look, when Ashraf Rifi speaks, I'm like, my heart sings. <laughs> okay. 
Um, and then when Jibran Basil speaks, I just want to put a bullet in, 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 in my head. And one is a Sunni from Tripoli, and the other is a Maronite from Mount Lebanon in the, in the historical sense, or from Batroun, right? So it took me some time to... These, this is how things started evolving, right? And, and then you start thinking, okay, um, uh, Lebanese-ness is not you know, the reserve domain of one group and others are all the time necessarily hostile uh, to it. It took some time to, to... On the other hand, as a journalist, because I was a journalist, uh, I was a reporter for LBC between 2005 and, and 2000... Uh, uh, to, uh, forgive me, 2003, 2004, uh, and, and 2005. I'm yeah. saying yeah. that I know you you yeah. and I don't know you. Yeah. It finally makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I you was, were on TV. I was on TV for three years. But that, but that, the point is, I as a, as a journalist, I came to go to Tripoli. I came to go to mm. Al Hermel, I came to basically see the country a bit more. Yeah. And I was struck by how much poverty. And of all my life, speaking of things that did not change, I had a thing. I had a. Um, I don't come from a very wealthy family myself, you know. I, you know, my, my, I'm, I'm come, I come from lower middle class. Both of my parents are civil servants; they're school teachers in the public educational sector. And now these people never made a lot of money. And then since the 1980s, their situation was really yeah, no. okay. So because of my own family background, I have a thing for the poor, you know. And so I, when I, when I you know, came face to face with so much poverty in like Hayel Mankubin, Tripoli and the Bene and, yeah. and, and what have you. So that also things in me were like on the one hand, politically, they're like me. Like we are in the same big manifestation in two thousand five against the Syrian opposition. On on the other hand, clearly they they're suffering and these are my so this is when as of two thousand five, mm. you know, there was an emotional change in me. But whereby should, I started thinking these are my fellow country, country please, no, no, fellow but I, countrymen. No, yeah. no, I love complicated yeah. people yeah. in a positive way, not yeah. a negative. Yeah. So you're describing something, when I hear it, mm. would drive somebody away from federalism. Mm. You're describing your, the appeal yeah. of somebody in Tripoli yeah. to you. Yeah. Spe- you said things, right? Yeah. And then your own sort of, let's say, if you want to make it a little more narrow, what should appeal more to you doesn't. Yeah. Poverty, you see it everywhere, yeah. and it resonates. Yeah. I, that's the kind of Lebanon that it, pu- uh, that that's, that's the experience that makes sense to me. Yeah. That there's so much commonality. Yeah. That doesn't speak directly, at least to yeah. me, to federalism as a form of government. Yeah. But I like that. Yeah. Because you can be both. Yeah, you can be both. Have you listened yeah. to no, no, federalism? That's why, yeah, I like no. I like the. Uh, the ability to approach it in a way that is healthy, yeah. but you're also looking at it as a complicated thing of, too. Of yeah, course, I, I love uh, that. Ronnie, I want to yeah. tell you something. One, I mean, we didn't have the time to talk so much about federalism, but one yet another reason why I think federalism is good, because when I think about poverty in Akkad, poverty in Tripoli, poverty in Baal Bakl and what have you, I don't see a way out for the country absent a kind of decentralization that would allow political decentralization yeah, that right. would allow people in these parts of the country to make their own decisions and have their own government and basically be able to punish politicians who are not doing well for the economy locally. I want this, I want to empower these people. You see what I mean? I want people who are poor in Akkad to say, look, if you keep me poor, uh, I'm going to vote you out. They cannot do that from within the confines of a central government, but they would be able to do that if there is a government in Akkar and government in Tripoli. Right. So my commitment to the poor is one dimension of of my federal thinking. Right. Because I mean, because I think about poverty and and because I think a lot about redistribution, I I struggle to see how redistribution could happen from within the current regime. And am I yeah. saying this right, that it's also an acknowledgement, going back to the example of yeah. Zahli yeah. and the Ministry of Education, yeah. that your footprint in, let's say, Akka yeah. or Tripoli yeah. is small, yeah. if, if it's there to begin with. Yeah. Your footprint here, where you're from at least, yeah. is visible. It's bigger, yeah. And you want the people that are suffering like you yeah. in other parts of the country... Yeah. To have the same tools that you would have to fix Absolutely. those problems. Yeah. So it's really it's just called a, empowerment. It's empowerment at yeah. the end of the day. It's yeah. empowerment. Yeah. Uh, and and so in French we say devolution du pouvoir. Mm-hmm. You're taking yeah. power from the center and you're basically right. uh, you know spreading 
power yeah. in, in, uh, in, in the regions. And mm. this is yes. how you basically you would, you would allow uh, a local politician who's uh, a failure, then you know, the local electorate could, could, could have a say right. uh, in it. But that's not how things happen in the current system. I'm glad that you gave me an hour and a half of your time. It's my honor. A day before you're traveling. It's my honor. And I know that it was maybe a third federalism. Yeah. I think maybe there's a podcast series yeah. in itself that should talk about that issue alone. Perfect. So maybe in a future date when you're back in the country, we in can December. pick up in December. <laughs> I want to say something, though. Yeah. Um, for me, it's not easy to tell a story. Mm. Uh, it takes talent. And it, I think it's not... It comes natural maybe to professors who, who lecture and have to think of a, of a way to um, persuade. Yeah. And the MTV animation is something that's so appealing, whether you agree with it or not, it's not even the point, but that it's an accessible explanation for one idea, and it invites the listener or the viewer into the conversation. Mm. I really think it's a, it's a very well done. Thank you animation, illustration. Thank you. You're too kind, but no, thank you. I, and I'll say one more thing. Uh, I'm glad that you're thinking of at least coming back to Lebanon more. Always. That, I think, uh, is necessary because you, like many people I know, have now one foot in, one foot out, not, for, not because their heart asks for it, but that's the only way because you can... Because it is what it is. Only way to function. S- essentially, my career is outside, but my raison d'etre, yeah. my reason for being is in this country and it's I think it's going to always be the same I feel the same way good Hisham, I'm glad thank you thank you my friend thank you Ronnie. I enjoyed this <laughs> we did it thank you so much <laughs> we did it thank you Habibi <laughs> thanks for listening and watching and a friendly reminder to support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal all links are in the details box Until next time, I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan.